So Marianne's trying to get it streamed, and it's just not wanting to cooperate. The internet's not wanting to cooperate, so trying something else. Anyway, so causing problems. In, uh, in 1716, Jonathan Edwards went to college, started Yale College at the age of 13. 13 years old, he started college. And four years later, he graduated at the top of his class. He later went on to be the uh, third president of Princeton. Well, it's called Princeton now. It was then called the College of New Jersey. But his fame lives on primarily because of his leadership during a series of revivals that took place in New England that have become known as the Great Awakening. And his most famous sermon was titled, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And maybe you've heard that title before, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. It's an interesting title, you know, when we think about what the Bible has to say about getting angry. You know, we usually attach a negative meaning to anger because of what the Bible teaches. But anger is an emotion, you know, and, and we go through a wide range of emotions. Most everyone becomes angry at one time or another. Have you ever wondered if God gets angry? Well, according to, to Edward's sermon title, uh, God does get angry, or at least he thinks so. And so this evening, I want to look at some scripture passages that talk about the topic of anger or, or wrath. And the first is found in the fourth chapter of Genesis. And so if you'll turn with me to Genesis chapter 4. And this chapter follows chapter 3 in which Adam and Eve you know, eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil after being tempted by the serpent. And so they are no longer in the garden. Genesis 4, beginning with verse 1. Adam made love to his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, With the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later she gave birth to his, son, or to his brother Abel. Now Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. While they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. All right, so Cain and Abel are the, the first two sons of Adam and Eve. And, and at some point, they began to make offerings to God. We don't know when it started, why it started, how they knew to do this. You know, we just assume that they were instructed by God on the whys and the hows. And so that they would know to do that. Some believe that they took these offerings to the entrance to the Garden of Eden. In, uh, and that would make sense because it was in the Garden of Eden that Adam and Eve met with God. And so they would attribute, you know, think of God's presence there at the entrance. Um, we read in, in, at the end of chapter 3, Genesis 3, verse 24, and he drove the man out. He placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden, cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. All right, so 
There's this, there's this cherubim blocking them from going back in, and perhaps this is where they made these offerings. All we know is Cain and Abel make these offerings. Cain's is not accepted by God, while Abel's is. All right, so why did Cain become angry? He became angry because his, his offering wasn't accepted. He, he brought something just like his brother had. His brother's was accepted. His, his wasn't. And he becomes angry. Now, we're not told toward whom he directed his anger. Was he angry at Cain or at Abel? Was he angry at his brother? Was he angry at God? Maybe he was angry at both of them. He certainly took out his anger on his brother. We're also not told why God didn't accept his offering. Was it because Cain brought plants as opposed to an animal like Abel had done? Or was it because of his attitude? We read in Proverbs 21 verse 27, The sacrifice of the wicked is detestable, how much more so when brought with evil intent. So perhaps it wasn't what he brought, but how he brought it. His attitude that made it unacceptable to God. You know, God evaluates our motives for giving. Not just how much we give, what we give, but, but how we do it. What, what our attitudes are. And so the result of his offering not being accepted was anger. He got mad. Cain got mad. So what did he do? Well, he took his brother out into the field, and he killed him. And this clues us in on why anger is, is so potentially dangerous. Because anger can lead us to act in ways that you know, we wouldn't otherwise. We tend to say things and do things that we wouldn't say and do, and, and then that we later regret them. You ever wonder if if Cain later regretted killing Abel. You know, most people don't like being told that they've done something wrong, and, and Cain didn't appreciate being told by God that he had done wrong either. God gave Cain the opportunity to make it right, but he didn't. Instead, he just kind of simmered in his anger until it reached a boiling point. You know, what do we do when we're corrected, you know, do we look, as, look at it as an opportunity to grow? Or do we become angry like Cain did? Turn to Exodus 4. Exodus 4, verses 10 through 17. Exodus 4, 10 through 17. Moses is out tending his father-in-law's sheep when he goes over and uh, notices this bush that's on fire and God begins to talk to him. In verse 10 we read, Moses said to the Lord, Pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue, the Lord said to him. Who gave human beings their mouths? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will help you speak and teach you what to say. But Moses said, Pardon your servant, Lord. Please send someone else. Then the Lord's anger burned against Moses, and he said, what about your brother Aaron, the Levite? I know he can speak well. He is already on his way to meet you, and he will be glad to see you. You shall speak to him and put words in his mouth. I will help both of you speak and will teach you what to do. He will speak to the people for you, and it will be as if he were your mouth and as if you were God to him. But take this staff in your hand, so you can perform signs with it. So God has talked to Moses. He said, I want you to go back and, and get my people. Lead them out of Egypt. Lead them 
out of slavery to the land, the promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey. And what does Moses say? I don't want to go. And here he says, you know, I, I, I just can't speak well. You know, you really ought to find someone else. So why did God become angry with Moses? Well, he became angry because he refused to obey. You know, he's, he's mentioned, by the time we get to this passage, he's already asked him uh, a few times. And, and Moses keeps saying no. And then he gives that excuse. Well, I just, I can't speak well. You know, I, you need to find somebody that can speak better than, than I can. And God tells him, look, who, who enables someone to speak? Who enables someone to see? I'm the one who gives you speech. I'm the one who, who gives you sight. If I can do that, I can help you when you get to Pharaoh. What more does he need? And the answer is nothing. God's going to give him everything he needs. And what is Moses' response? No. Send somebody else. I mean, he's still refusing to go. And so we read that God became angry. Even after all that God had said, he refuses. Do you think God still becomes upset with people who refuse to obey him, to serve him, and instead just offer up excuses for why they can't? Uh, 2 Kings, turn to 2 Kings chapter 5 for our next passage. This story is about Naaman. Naaman was the commander of, one, of the army of one of Israel's biggest enemies at that time, um, Aram. And Naaman had contracted leprosy. At that time, the leprosy was a death sentence. There was nothing they could do for it. Yeah. And so none of the doctors could help him. But the servant of Naaman's wife had an idea. She was an Israelite girl who had been taken captive uh, by uh, Naaman's army. And this servant girl from Israel suggests that Naaman go and visit the prophet Elisha in Israel. And so he didn't have any other options, so he did what she suggested. But when he got to Elisha's house, Elisha wouldn't even come out and talk to him. All right, here's what we read. So 2 Kings chapter 5, beginning with verse 10. Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, Go, wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored, and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought he would surely come out to me and, and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and, and wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and, and, and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something, some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, as the man of God had told him, and his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. All right, so what was the reaction of Naaman? <laughs> he, he got mad. He got mad. First, he got mad because Elisha wouldn't go out to meet him. I mean, didn't Elisha know who he was? He's the commander of one of the greatest armies in the world. Just his presence should demand respect. He should have come out to him personally, bowed down before him, not sent out some messenger, some servant. So he got mad. He was also mad 
Because Naaman figured Elisha would come out and, and like the sorcerers he was familiar with, would say some magical words and wave a wand or his hand over the leprous spot, you know, do something he didn't understand, and presto, he'd be healed. But Elisha didn't do that either. Instead, Elisha said, eh, go down to the Jordan River and dip yourself seven times, which infuriated him some more. I mean, the Jordan's really not that impressive. It's not very big. It's kind of muddy. He says, we got much better rivers back home. Why should I go down to this muddy stream when we've got some real rivers, you know, that to be admired back home? And so he, he got mad. And how did, Haman's, or how did Naaman's servants handle the situation? Well, they helped Naaman realize the true reason for his anger. Why was he mad? He was mad because Elisha wasn't doing things the way he thought they should be done. He thought, again, Elisha should come out there and bow before him. He thought Elisha should wave his hand and say some magic words and everything should be taken care of. It, it wasn't going the way he thought it was, should go. So he got mad. And, and really, isn't that the cause of most anger? Because things aren't going the way we think they should be going? Have you ever lost your temper simply because people weren't doing things the way you thought they should be done? Uh, Mark, turn to Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3. This is still pretty early in Jesus' ministry, but even still the, the religious leaders are trying to find ways to get rid of Jesus. And on this occasion, uh, they've brought a man to the synagogue on the Sabbath who, who had a withered hand. He's got this deformity, and they're going to see if Jesus will heal him on the Sabbath. All right, so Mark chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. Another time, Jesus went into the synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, Stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked them, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they remained silent. He looked around them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts and said to the man, stretch out your hand. And his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. Now, what did Jesus do that caused the religious leaders to become angry? He, he healed this guy on the Sabbath. This was a day of rest. And they equated healing with work, and you weren't supposed to work, so Jesus is working and he's doing it on the Sabbath. I mean, this is supposed to be a religious teacher, a religious leader. And Jesus is breaking the law, breaking their traditions. He's healing on the Sabbath. And it didn't help that Jesus was gaining uh, followers. He's gaining popularity. And so instead of recognizing Jesus as the promised Messiah that they'd been waiting for, they look at Jesus like he was their enemy. And they get mad. What was the reaction of Jesus? Well, he became mad too. He was angry that the religious leaders were more concerned with their traditions and their rules than they were with this man who needed help. Jesus thought that the man was more important. And so we might ask the question, is anger ever a correct response? Is anger ever the correct response? Well, it was for Jesus. 
And so the situation is this. It's, it's correct when people are being hurt or abused. Jesus wasn't angry about the way he was being treated. They weren't treating him right. He was angry because of the way they were treating this man. You know, when we become angry, you know, it should be because of the way someone else is being treated. In other words, we're not being ang becoming angry because of how we're treated, but because of how others are treated. And, and even then, though, we need to be cautious. You know, anger should be used to find constructive solutions rather than just to tear people down. Okay, turn to John chapter 3. John chapter 3, and, and we'll read verses 35 and, and 36. John 3, verses 35 and 36. Jesus says, The Father loves the Son and has placed everything in His hands. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. All right, so what will happen? What calamity will people suffer who reject Jesus as God's Son and Redeemer? Well, we're told that they will experience God's wrath. You know, the, these verses are referring to the final judgment, and they contrast those who, who place their faith in Jesus and those who don't place their faith in Jesus. Those who, who believe in Jesus will receive eternal life, but those who do not believe will receive God's wrath, his anger. You know, Jesus had warned the disciples in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. And so again, we, we read about God's anger, his wrath on those who refuse to believe in Jesus. All right, Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. All right, so Jesus said that we should be afraid of the wrath of God. We should be afraid of God who can kill our soul. Don't, not to be afraid of people who can just kill the body. Our bodies are going to die. We, we know we're going to die. That's, that's not a question. So don't fear that. Fear God who can also kill your soul. Now, in this passage, Paul says that God's wrath is already being experienced. God's judgment. You know, there's going to be a day when everyone will be judged, but Paul's saying that judgment is already coming against those who rebel against God. Paul wrote, Beginning with verse 18, Romans 1, beginning with verse 18, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over in, their, in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the Creator, who is forever praised. Amen. 
Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lust. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. Now, according to these verses, who is God's wrath being poured out on? It's being poured out on those who are turning against God, rebelling against God. Specifically, he, he mentions immorality. And, and why is it, why is God's wrath against those? Well, Paul says it's because they should know better. He said they should know that there is a God and worship him only. But instead, they worship something they make with their hands that resemble themselves or nature. They should know better, but they do it anyway. And so Paul says they are without excuse. They've substituted the truth of God for a lie. And because God can't ignore sin, he deals with it. And so Paul says God's wrath is being poured out. Again, we, we all know there will be a day of judgment. But Paul says that judgment is already happening. And the way God's judgment is happening is that God doesn't stop them. God just allows them. You know, that's, that's going to hurt you. you. You shouldn't do that, but go ahead, do it. He, God says, Paul says God just allows them to continue in their sin and then to reap the consequences of it. All right, Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4, verses 26 and 27. Paul says, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. What should we do if we do get angry? Well, this passage says that we're not to sin. Notice, we're not told not to get angry. We're not told don't get angry. What we're told is don't sin. In your anger, don't sin. When you get angry, don't sin. So how do we sin when we get angry? Well, we sin when we get angry when we lose control of our actions and our speech. Like I said earlier, when we lose control, we say and do things we wouldn't say and do otherwise. We allow our anger to control us. We allow our emotions to control us. We often end up saying and doing things that aren't honoring to God. But when we get angry like that, we're also trying to punish the person that we're angry with. Which means we're trying to play God. Instead of allowing God to punish them, if they've done something wrong, allow God to handle it, we're taking God's role. And so we're supposed to leave it with God. How do we get angry and not sin? Well, we're, we're to handle our anger properly. We, sh we shouldn't allow it to control us. And we need to make sure that we're getting angry for the right reasons. As I mentioned before, Jesus got angry, but it wasn't for himself. It was for someone else. And Paul also tells us to deal with our anger immediately. Before the sun goes down. So as not to allow our anger to become between us. Come between us and someone else. You know, and thus hurt our relations. When we nurse anger, we give the devil a foothold in, it, in our lives, and it gives the devil an opportunity to divide us. And so Paul says, in your anger, don't sin. James chapter 1, James chapter 1, 
verses 19 and 20. We looked at these verses not too long ago. James chapter 1, beginning with verse 19. James writes, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Why do we become angry quickly? Well, often it's because we haven't taken time to listen to the person we're angry with. To understand their position. To understand where they're coming from. And so to put brakes on our anger, you know, that people have come up with different suggestions. Count to ten. It can help. But James here says to listen. Be quick to listen. Slow to speak. Slow to become angry. You know, seek to understand. Not just to be understood. Revelation 6. Revelation 6, verses 15 through 17. Then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and everyone else, both slave and free, hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They called to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can withstand it? I said, what are the people doing? They're hiding. They're going up into the mountains and they're hiding in caves, hiding behind rocks, trying to protect themselves from God's wrath. And why are they fearful of God's wrath? Because they understand God's judgment's coming. They understand they've sinned. They understand they deserve God's judgment and they're trying to protect themselves from it. They would rather have a mountain fall on them than face God in his judgment. You know, they, they, in their lives, they've showed no fear of God. They've arrogantly flaunted their sin. But when judgment comes, we read how they'll shrink back. Of course, if we have trusted in Jesus... We have nothing to fear. All right, Revelation 12. Revelation 12, and we'll read verses 12, and then we'll skip down to verse 17. Revelation 12, verse 12. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury, because he knows that his time is short. Verse 17. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring, those who keep God's commands and hold fast their testimony about Jesus. All right, so why is the devil enraged? Well, he's enraged because he knows his, his time's almost up. Judgment is coming, and so he's getting mad. How about the serpent? Who's the serpent displaying his anger toward? Well, he, he takes out his anger towards the woman. He takes his anger towards the people on earth, and particularly believers, to Christians, who we're told hold on to their testimony about Jesus. They just won't stop believing in Jesus. They won't stop telling others about Jesus. And so we're told how this dragon, how the dragon becomes angry. All right, and Revelation 19. And we're going to read several verses 
Revelation 19, beginning with verse 11. John says, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword which no, with, with which to strike down the nations. He will rule, rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has the name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun who cried in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair, Come, gather together for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings, generals, and the mighty, of horses and their riders, all the flesh of all people, free and slave, great and small. And I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to wage war against the rider on the horse and his army. But the beast was captured and with it the false prophet who had performed the signs on his behalf. With these signs he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. The rest were killed with the sword coming out of the mouth of the rider on the horse, and all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. How will Jesus finally express God's wrath toward all of those who have rebelled against God, who have approved of evil, who have opposed God's truth? Well, these verses say that those who oppose God will be thrown into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. You know, the first time Jesus came, he came as a lamb. A lamb to be sacrificed. But the next time he comes, he's going to come as a victorious king. With his first coming, he brought forgiveness. But with his second coming, he's going to bring judgment. And these verses provide a graphic description of the wrath of God against the devil, against sin. But again, there, there will be mercy for those who trust in Jesus. Now, there are a lot more verses about anger. Because throughout the Bible, we're, we're told over and over again not to get angry. Proverbs 15, 18. A hot-tempered person stirs up conflict. But the one who is patient calms a quarrel. Proverbs 19.11 A person's wisdom yields patience. It is to one's glory to overlook an offense. Proverbs 29.11 Fools give vent to their rage, but the wise bring calm in the end. Ecclesiastes 7.9 do not be quickly provoked in your spirit, for anger resides in the lap of fools. In Colossians 3.8, But now you must also rid yourself of such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. The Bible warns us about losing our temper. But again, anger is not the sin, it's it's why we're angry that's the problem and what we do with that anger that's a problem. Now, as Paul wrote to the Ephesians, do not sin in your anger. Jesus got angry at the Pharisees because of the way they had mistreated this man. We read that 
He is going to bring God's wrath, his anger, and it will be poured out on all who rebel against him. But Paul wrote in, in Romans 12, verse 19, that we shouldn't take that role. That's God's role to judge others, and we should allow him to do it. We shouldn't take God's vengeance upon ourselves and, and try to do it for ourselves. And then a few verses later in Romans 12, Paul says that instead of becoming angry with those who abuse us, who, who say evil against us, instead we should try to do good to them. Repay evil with good. And so instead of holding on to anger, we should pray for the person who angers us. You know, the key is to convert our anger into love for others. Because God has loved us. God has forgiven us. And so we should try to forgive others in the same way.